HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. I'm Oscar Simone for Heritage Radio Network On Tour here at Good Food Mercantile in Brooklyn, New York. This coverage is supported in part by the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts. And I'm here with Shay of DRAM. Hello. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your, your seltzer company and what, what you guys produce besides just seltzer? Sure. Um, so we're based out of Salida, Colorado, which is a rural town about three hours south of Denver. Uh, we have a small farm there where we've started growing uh, an abundance of different adaptogenic herbs. And um, this past year, in addition to sparkling waters and um, cocktail bitters, we started selling sparkling waters with CBD, with hemp cannabidiol, and um, also a line of CBD drops that can be used for stress relief, for pain relief. They can be mixed into cocktails. They make really great mocktails. Uh, so we're just here at the show um, sampling everything we have to offer. Wow. And talk to me, obviously, like these days, things like LaCroix, or, or LaCroix, however you want to say it, are popping off, and everyone's trying to kind of turn away from sodas and sugary drinks, and everyone still wants that, or most people still want that, like, flavored drink. Um, and I think Dram totally offers it with pretty good health benefits as well, right? Yeah, so what sets us apart from LaCroix or other uh, sparkling water, flavored sparkling waters, is we don't use any natural flavorings. Um, that's kind of a misnomer. A lot of the uh, flavorings that are used for brands like Polar, LaCroix, any of those big name seltzers, they're still chemically derived. Um, and that's because it's that's the cheap way to make flavored sparkling water. So what we do is we use whole plants, roots, barks, flowers, um, all different kinds of herbs, and we make our own glycerin extracts, and then we put those into our sparkling waters. And glycerin is, what is glycerin? Talk about that. So glycerin is considered a sugar alcohol, even though it doesn't have any alcohol. Um, you make glycerin by distilling oil, vegetable oil. So in the case of our products, we use an organic soy and flax-based glycerin, and it tastes a little sweet to the palate, but it has no effect on your blood sugar. And can you talk a little bit about the, the effects of the, the CBD oil? Or Yeah, um, so the way that hemp CBD works in the human body, uh, you have an endocannabinoid system, which is kind of crazy that we have a built-in system to receive cannabidiol, which is in marijuana and hemp plants. And what that does is it has an influence on your parasympathetic nervous system, which is going to help calm things like anxiety, sleeplessness, depression, um, any kind of inflammation. So it's really popular for uh, pain relief, both topically and orally. Um, it can just kind of help ease all of our modern day ailments. And I think that's probably why it's gaining so much traction right now. Awesome. And you guys sell your flavored seltzers infused with the CBD oil in addition to some drops. some drops. Yeah, we sell drops that you can take under your tongue. You can also, you can use them for baking. You can put them in coffee. Oh, sweet. Yeah. And um, what's the, tell me a little bit about your operation. You guys are based out of Salida, Colorado. Yep. 
Uh, we're a small team of four. It's me and my husband and two employees. Uh, we run every single step of it from uh, growing to producing to bottling, labeling, shipping. We, we do it all. We've been in business for eight years now. Wow, that's awesome. And you were talking about how you guys don't use the misnomered natural flavors, um, but you are taking it from actual plants and creating these flavors. Are you guys doing that part as well? Yep. Yeah, we do all of our extractions in-house. Uh, time is what makes those. It takes generally three to six months to make a glycerin extraction. So we have a bunch of tanks going at one time so we can always keep up with production. And what do you guys get out of doing this all yourself as opposed to just getting it off the internet or from distributor, whatever it is. As far as the extracts? Yeah. I mean, there's there's not anyone making, like, commercially available glycerin extracts. You, you can, I mean, there's glycerin tinctures just for general health maintenance, but this isn't anything you can buy so that, you know, we invented this process ourselves. All right, brand new stuff over here at DRAM. And if people want to get their hands on this product, the delicious seltzers, the CBD-infused seltzers, the drops, where can they find these things? Uh, well, first of all, our website, dramapothecary.com. And then here in New York, we're at Upstate Stock, Clover, and all of the Mr. Fruit bodegas, like Mr. Plum, Mr. Orange, those, those places. So. That's awesome. All right, thank you so much, Shay. It was really good speaking with you. Thank I'm Oscar Simone for Heritage Radio Network on Tour, here at Good Food Mercantile in Brooklyn, New York. This coverage is supported in part by the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts. And I'm here with... Morsina Katimin. And what company are you here with? By myself? By what, yourself. What do you mean? What's their product that you've got here today? Uh, uh, I represent Sajen. Uh, the uh, flavor from Indonesia and Southeast Asia in general. All right. And I've, I've had a couple tastes, and I had to get a couple questions in because the stuff is amazing. Can you talk about some of the products that we have in front of us here? Okay. Today I'm bringing you uh, Jamu, J-A-M-U, which is a drink that's made with uh, root spices and all the spices that's available in, you know, spices that's available in Southeast Asia. Like uh, cinnamon, candle nuts, turmeric, and galangal, and stuff like that. And what sort of benefits do these spices present for people? Well, people have been drinking jamu for generations. It's like known to cure things. Before the uh, Western medicine came into the society, we depend on jamu. But jamu today is more like a flavorful thing. It helps you with like an alternative medicine, but it's not really an alternative medicine. It's kind of a traditional medicine right. that depends on whatever you find in your garden or in your area. It's supposed to be local. You're not supposed to... A jamu is uh, supposed to be a local product. Mm. Uh, they do not uh, have uh, spice from like a cake a flower from the Middle East or something like that. We don't do that. And we sweeten it with a coconut sugar. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, and we, uh, we preserved it with uh, either calamansi juice or tamarind juice. Okay. Yeah. And it has a very low pH level. Ah, and what, what does that mean for that the non-scientists? Means, oh. Uh, a pH level, the way I under, understand it, it sort of helps the product to stay longer on the shelf and gets better as it ages and stuff like that. Right now, I have uh, 12 flavors, and that is hibiscus infused with cloves and what else? Uh, a few spices and cinnamon, and that's the flavor. Cinnamon is really good for your, uh, to lower your blood sugar level. I knew it because I'm also diabetic, and I drink this to bring down my sugar level. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and I just tasted that one. It's got a really floral, almost mold wine flavor. Super delicious, nice and sweet. And as she said, 
it's coconut sugar, so it's not it's not as harmful as your your other sugars. And the sugar level is not really very high. It's only about three grams and four grams oh, for wow. the entire bottle, so it's not really high at all. That's the idea of Jamu. Jamu is to be uh, drunk with, with no sugar. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and then you also have this this hot sauce over here. Yeah. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? We have a hot sauce too. Uh, we have like six hot sauces. Oh, wow. One is this one is nasi goreng right now that we have, and we have a sambal batawi, which is the, the red version of this. And then we have. Uh, oh, by the way, do you want to try my uh, cashew nut sauce? But then I have no label with it. Oh, absolutely! This is an exclusive just for HRN on tour. I'm so excited. Oh, wow. I forgot the label. Oh, I no. got the wrong case. Oh, no. I it, put the labels and everything, and then when I open up, it has no, it's the wrong case. So if you open it for me, yeah. this one won, a, won an award oh, last wow. year. Smell it. Oh, wow. Most of my... Is that chilies? Yeah. Most of my products has this... Uh, it, it heightens your senses at least three or four of the five senses. Oh, wow. And that is your sight, your smell, the taste, but you cannot hear it, right? <laughs> and the feel. <laughs> so at least three senses are you taking care of. Well, we hope our listeners at, at Heritage Radio, are uh, their hearing is, is all good because this product won't help your hearing, unfortunately. This. this is cashew nuts. All right, so I am tasting different than a lot of other this red curry cashew nut hot sauce. Here it goes. Oh, wow. It's pretty sweet. Yeah, not as spicy as the other one. Yeah. No. Yeah. Wow. It is a, it's really good. a satay version. Mm-hmm. Peanut sauce is a satay version. Oh. And this is a cashew nuts instead okay. of peanut. So, I do. And she's grabbing a couple more things for us to try. In the green hot sauce, the nasi goreng is made with green chilies as well as dried shrimp powder and a bunch of spices. And that one's super delicious and really, really spicy. But it's, a, the, it's really authentic because Indonesian people, when they eat nasi goreng which is fried rice in the morning they use green chilies they don't use red chilies they do not use soy sauce and but then it's a, a huge in umami flavor mm. have you tried there is kind of shrimp paste that has sort of an umami flavor to it yeah yeah, yeah. so right now i know you're trying to expand to get your products on the east coast but if someone wants to try this right now where can they get their hands on it I don't think in the East Coast. We but have any and products. where? Where? Else? Uh, online. Online. Okay. So what's the what's the website called? So you can go to www.sajen-jamu.com. Sajen dash jamu dot com. Sajen dash jamu dot com for those delicious drinks and hot sauces. This is the flavor, the hot right. sauce. And then for the hot sauces, you're going to want to go to www.sambal-sambal.com. That's www.sambal-sambal.com. And it's all part of Sajen Incorporated, yes, correct? Yes. All right. Thank you so much for talking to me today. And what's your name again? My name is Morsina. Morsina. An ancient name of Indonesia. Nobody has that name anymore. All right. First one I've met. Thank you so much again. Thank you. I'm Oscar Simone for Heritage Radio Network on tour here at Good Food Mercantile in Brooklyn, New York. This coverage is supported in part by the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts. And I'm here with Natasha of Green Dirt Farm. Hi, Natasha. Hi. How are you doing today? Doing well, Oscar. So talk to me a little bit about Green Dirt Farm. You guys are a, an artisan cheese-making company. And what does that really mean? We are a small sheep's milk dairy um, based out of Kansas City, Missouri. 
Actually, we're based out of Western Missouri, which is about 15 minutes from the Kansas City Airport. Um, we have a small team, one cheesemaker, one shepherdess, um, one salesperson, and one orders of fulfillment team. We all help out and make and package the cheese. Yeah, it's collectively... Um, so there are about eight of us total. We all do everything. And our main goal is to uh, help the erosion that was happening in the soil of our farm. So we started raising sheep there um, to, as a step towards regenerative farming. Um, Sarah was a doctor for many years and wanted to raise her family on a farm. And once they bought the farm, she discovered her love of chemistry and cheese making. So then she created Bassa, which is our flagship cheese that we still make to this day. And what is, is Bassa something of your own invention, or is that something that other makers make and you guys are? I think Bassa um, does mimic other cheeses, but she was able to go in and create a recipe that is her own. So she took um, another style of cheese and combined it with another style of cheese and created Bassa. Bassa is a wash rind cheese that um, is meaty in flavor, but creamy in texture. And what's the like a quintessential difference? You guys are all sheep, sheep's milk cheese. And what's like a quintessential difference between sheep's milk and the co more common cow's milk cheese? Um, our cheese, sheep's milk cheese has a higher fat content. So there is less lactose, more fat. And in that, I've found that it's easier on people who cannot have lactose. So it's another alternative uh, if you love cheese but just can't enjoy it the way you want to. Oh, and that is me. So tell me a little bit about, you told me you have an, it's an eight-person operation, but are you guys sourcing your milk from a specific place? What, what's that side of the business like? Well, we um, have sheep that we milk ourselves. But we also had to partner with a Amish family to be able to make and produce the amount of cheese that we need to. Um, with, with sheep, you do not get a lot of milk. So it's all about building relationships and connecting those relationships to our practices as well. So with partnering with someone, we had to make sure that they also had animal welfare approved practices, which means that we cherish our animals and we want them to to be the way that they would naturally be in nature. So our animals graze on both farms and we put them out to pasture and let them go. Awesome. And uh, talk to me a little bit about some of your, some of your other products besides the, uh, the Bassa. Um, I like it because we have a wide variety of products and a lot of different price ranges. So everyone can't really go, everyone can't afford to spend 15, 20 dollars on one piece of cheese. So we have cheeses anywhere from $5 to $15 so that you can still enjoy the quality of our cheese. It doesn't matter what the price point is. And that, that $5 cheese that you're talking about, that's the, uh, these, uh, these... Fresh, credible cheeses fresh, fresh. that come in six different flavors. So it's not like just getting one item, but you can, you can spread it out and get whatever you want. We also have Tuffet which is a bloomy rind cheese, and it's beautiful on any, any board. And it's also anywhere from like 640 to about 750. So it's another pretty, pretty cost-effective cheese. And where can the people, myself included, find, find the, the Green Dirt Farm cheeses to, to purchase? Um, any Whole Foods. We are in Whole Foods, Nature Zone, and some natural grocers. Awesome. Thank you so much for speaking with me, Natasha. So Oscar, thank you for the opportunity. Of course. I'm Oscar Simone for Heritage Radio Network on tour here at Good Food Mercantile in Brooklyn, New York. This coverage is supported in part by the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts. And I'm here with Donna Moody of Miss Marjorie's Steel Drum Plantains. Hi, Donna. How are you doing today? I'm great. Hi. Thank so, you. Just to start, I know that this product stemmed out of a restaurant that you have. Can you talk a little bit about that restaurant and the vibe and what you guys do over there? Absolutely. I have a restaurant in Seattle called Marjorie Restaurant. It's named uh, as an honor to my mom, who loved cooking and entertaining. My family's from Jamaica, and when we moved to Chicago on the south side, 
in the 70s, my mom just quickly adopted the style of cooking and entertaining that she had practiced in Jamaica. And we ended up always having like a house full of people, lots of dinner parties, lots of cooking with natural fresh ingredients. And it kind of led me to the restaurant industry. And then uh, we started packaging our most popular appetizer. So you guys served these at the restaurant. Was it like, were you like, okay, we need to start selling these. They're so popular. Or people were like, can, you, can we get some of these at home? Like what was going on? It's kind of a combination. They were so popular. I know that we wanted to sell them. And then customers were like, we need these 24-7. You have to make them available. So kind of a combination of both things. But one of the things that really inspired me was that my mom was very elegant and while she loved all the cooking things, she also liked to put on a little lipstick, make herself look great for the dinner parties. So I wanted to package them really elegantly, make them look really beautiful, and make them feel special. And one of the ideas was to make the larger box kind of the perfect hostess gift. I also really like that they're gluten-free, they're natural, no added sugar. So there's a health factor to them without them being, like, too crunchy. Yeah. <laughs> They seem like the kind of perfect, kind of like almost, not not that they're without flavor, but like blank canvas for whatever you want to put on them. In your restaurant, what do you what do you guys usually dip it in? We love, we make a homemade guacamole. We do a black bean dip, a beet hummus, carrot butter. We use uh, salsas. Right now we've got a Oaxacan style salsa. We do it with ceviche. I love it with cheeses on cheese boards as a little alternative for a wheat-based cracker. So lots of, we're always kind of coming up with new things. That's awesome. So talk to me a little bit about, I know you've been in the restaurant business for a little bit. This might be your second, third venture with a Fourth. restaurant? Fourth. Okay, so what's the transition like from running a, a restaurant to all of a sudden you're creating a product for the, sh the shelves and you're packaging and you're distributing? I think one of the biggest transitions was realizing I didn't know everything about what I was getting into but I like learning new things and being stimulated. So for me, part of the challenge was also part of the fun and the magnet. I liked uh, examining packaging. I liked kind of driving the design I wanted, but using um, people that were well-informed on what makes sense in packaging for specialty foods. I really liked the idea of like examining things at a lab, finding out how you test shelf life, what the ingredients are, what the nutritional value is. So these products are all lab tested. Um, just getting FDA approval, getting Washington uh, DA approval. It's just all so new and interesting. Yeah, yeah, totally. And what's the the kind of the packaging operation like? You guys do it on site, right? We do it. Uh, we have a licensed facility at the restaurant, so we do it at the restaurant. And as we grow, we'll probably examine a different way to do it. But right now, that works for us. So talk to me about the process of making these beautiful plantain chips. So we get cases of plantains in regularly. We peel, slice, flash fry in non-GMO canola oil, sprinkle with a proprietary spice blend, and then the packaging begins. All right. And where, where are those plantains coming from again? Um, I notice that they usually come from Ecuador, but almost any place in South and Central America is a good supplier of plantains. Mm -hmm. And when I was in Australia recently, everyone there was trying to figure out how they could get plantains to Australia. So we kind of are, the wheels are spinning. Yeah. So where can I, where can I pick up a box of these, of these plantains for myself? If you're on the East Coast, we sell them at the Green Grape uh, Grocer in Brooklyn. We sell them at Chelsea Market Baskets, Kitchen Stadium. Back home, we sell them at Ken's Market, De Laurentiis, Metropolitan Markets, and lots of small little grocers. We're in Byright in San Francisco. So we're kind of in that, like, chip by chip, making uh, some new grounds. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And what's the difference between, like, your, your plantains and any old bag of plantains that I buy at the supermarket for the grocery store for 99 cents, whatever it is. So I like to call those bodega plantains, which I also love, and I grew up eating those as well. As a kid, we would get those the same way you would get a bag of chips. And I like to relay the difference of kind of that same thing. You can get a box of plantains that are packaged with the intention that they're not all breaking, they're not greasy, they're not kind of falling apart in the bag. 
or you can get a box and the box is just kind of elegantly packaged a lot of thought went into like every single thing that's on that label and they just they look pretty standing on the kitchen counter they absolutely do talk to me a little bit about the operation is do you have everyone that's working in the restaurant also working on this side of the business or like a, there's a little bit of a mix. I've got some people that just do plantains. We've got our chef helps with both um, operations. A lot of times if we have like a little lull in the restaurant, people help with plantains and vice versa. It's a pretty familial business, my restaurant. We've got about 14 employees, so it's not a huge operation. And whenever I get enticed to expand, I always think that I'd rather expand with like maybe another um, revenue stream than another restaurant so that we keep the personal familial nature of the business that we have right. so i see on the packaging it's got some spices but it's definitely a pretty streamlined flavor sticking to that plantain base which which is great and it's really delicious do you guys have any plans to like create a flavored version or throw something down on it uh you know that's um something that you're often uh told to do in the specialty food industry. I kind of like them just the way they are. Yeah. If I was going to do anything, we would probably work on packaging the dips mm -hmm. that we serve them with. Uh, those are not the dips that we serve them with. <laughs> At the restaurant, we make um, a really beautiful guacamole, black bean dip. We do a salsa that's kind of Oaxacan inspired, bead hummus, sweet potato hummus, really bright, flavorful things. Unfortunately, my dips did not make it on the flight with me. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. We have a substitute today. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to I'm going to get in on these. They're kind of addictive. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, but like minimal guilt factor. Oh yeah. I mean, I don't know. I haven't looked at the nutrition facts, but they're really, they're, they're vegetables, they're fruits, it's right? An all natural um, it's an all natural product. It's uh, four ingredients. The plantains, they're cooked in the non-GMO canola oil, spices and salt. That's it. Wow. Yeah. And how long could I uh, how long could I hold on to a box of these before they start to go go go? They have a six month shelf life. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty good. Lab tested. Ah. Uh, and was all that lab tested like with getting that FDA approval? Or did you guys kinda wanna go beyond that? It's kind of a little beyond that. You need the lab testing for shelf life. And then you need a nutritional label for FDA approval. So for me, I, it was really important to know how long we could date them for, and then also really important to know like the calories and to, to research a little bit too. Like I was looking at baking them. They didn't quite taste the same to me, and I found out our process has about the same caloric content of baked plantains. So, wow. yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. People usually just kind of think, oh, baked is better has to do with the temperature and the process that we use for making them and that I think also adds to the shelf life and the crispness. Cool. So they're delicious. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you were interested too to learn more about them. Yeah, totally, totally. And I don't know if you haven't tried them with cheese yet. You definitely need to take a little swipe there because the cheese and the plantains, it's like a gluten-free but it's naturally gluten-free, so they don't taste like cardboard. And it's just like it's such a nice alternative mm. on a cheese board, and it makes it look so pretty, and yeah. Yeah. I really like the aesthetics of food, so cool. that's and a big driving force for me. One more time for the people that want to get a box of these at home. Uh, where can they find them? So if you are in Seattle, they're in a lot of local uh, stores in the Northwest. They're also available on Amazon Prime. So that's kind of a national availability. And then they're also available out here on the East Coast at the Green Grape Grocer, uh, Chelsea Market Baskets, Stadium Kitchen. And, and at your restaurant, of course, right? Of course, always at our restaurant. I'll have to come give you a visit. Thank you, you so much, Donna. Should. Thank you so much for talking to me about my plantains that I love so much.